Hey there, Golden Bears. How are we today? I'm sure you're feeling fantastic. And of course, as always, keeping it classy. Well, let us go ahead and dive in. We're now on time period two or module two. Notice it goes from 1607 to 1754. Those are key, key dates. 1607 is the founding of Jamestown by the British uh, call is a British early part of the colony in 1754 is the French and Indian War. Those things might mean nothing to you now, but I hope at the end of time period two, you will kind of come to understand and how those things are two important aspects. So here we're going to begin talking about and, uh, this and, and shifting our attention away from Spain and the early uh, settlement by Columbus and his posse to the colonial America uh, and, and the emergence of and the influence of England on this new landscape of the new world. So with that, let's dive in to a brief little overview of how we connect all of this together. This is a, a book that was written uh, by Don Richardson uh, many, many years ago and then subsequently turned into a movie. But this was a missionary who went to, I, I believe, Papua New Guinea. And it was there as a missionary that he was trying to discover kind of the, the secrets to unlock uh, some spiritual conversation in the hearts of these literally um, man and flesh eating uh, type of people group who actually prided themselves on doing the following thing that they would lure different or opposing tribes into thinking that they were friends and would have friendship groups and and have sort of gatherings and get togethers if you would call them and that they would have a set time at some point when they invite one of the membering tribes members over and uh, while they're sitting there eating whatever vegetable they had in front of them, they would then club them to death and then consume them. And they would take pride in how they would lure them into this type of kind of sick um, festivity of, of how they kind of lived. And um, this, the longer the treachery went on, the greater the tales had become. And so many of these tribes in Papua New Guinea, that's how they operated in their degree of brokenness. That uh, That's how they monitored and brokered power. And, and so Don Richardson and his wife had this idea that what if um, something was in their culture that we can identify with our Christian culture? And so they discovered that if a tribe ever wanted to have long lasting, meaningful um, relationships on peace, that a chief from one tribe would have to give their eldest son or daughter to, or you know, recent baby, to the other chief there. And here you see one chief handing a baby to the other, and this then solidified both tribes will be linking up rather than being um, enemies uh, during this time. Excuse me while I adjust um, my, my slide over here for a second. There we go. Well, this, this missionary guy, Don Richardson, came up with this idea to use the illustration then, and not to be too much religious conversation, but this will make sense here, that just as Jesus was a child uh, brought by God into this world to bring peace to man, um, that th and, and just how these tribes had a peace child brought between them, he said instead of an actual child being born between you, what if Jesus or the be Jesus child would end enmity between all tribes, but more importantly, all people groups? And so this is a very interesting concept that Don Richardson had developed and, um, as I alluded to earlier, really drew um, a lot of attention along missionary circles way back in the 60s and 70s. Well, why do I tell that story to you? Because as we begin to unpack the second stage, if you will, of Spain expanding their um, influence everywhere from Mexico all the way to the tip of Florida, all the way up into the Californias, um, there's going to be examples um, where as as the Dutch and the French and eventually the British come into play, that the Native Americans are going to begin playing different um, colonists off of one another. But then also, like the Iroquois Confederation, you're going to have the, the Hudson tribe and the Iroquois tribe all you know near the, the, the Great Lakes begin fighting against each other. And so soon what we're going to find is that because of the colonists, there's no longer a peace child that keeps the peace between all all, all of the tribes together and we're going to find that who eventually loses out on this is that of the Native Americans across all um, uh, areas or regions um, there in the New World. 
So what I would like to say is that there in this time period, if you needed a word, I would call it intense competition, where you have European expansion colliding with the various forces there on the Western shore or the New World shore, if you will. So that leads us to module 2.1. That was just a little overview. So module 2.1 is how Europe's Europeans begin challenging the Spanish stronghold, if you will, along North America. And so with that, I want to share a little story like I typically do. Um, growing up in this H-town, you know, Hemet, um, it was a small little town. And um, it used to be kind of a bucolic place where uh, everybody knew everybody. And, it, you know, it just had some aspects to it that were really kind of Mayberry, USA. And um, one family friend of ours, they owned the local um, the sporting store. It was called BJ Sporting Store and our family friends last name were the Searles. And it was there that they, that's where we all went uh, to go buy our cleats, our gloves, our baseball uniforms, our mouthpieces for football gear, anything that was sports related, we went down to BJ's. That's where everybody uh, knew to go in town. Rarely would we drive all the way to Riverside to go have the same type of thing. But all of a sudden this new, you know, type of store, Walmart, or like a Home Depot, you name it, these big box stores, but Walmart was talking about moving into Little H Town. And it was there that you began seeing the small business owners really take um, offense to these changes that were taking place. So like, how are we ever going to make money? And you know what, truth be told, yeah, we didn't know. But we're like, yeah, bring on Walmart, because if we can get gloves there cheaper, boop, we're happy about that. Well, Walmart did some unique things that they did meet with the owners, the Searles and other small town owners. And they said, look, we're not here to run you out of business. We're just here to clarify for you what we will have in the stores and what we won't have in the stores. And because of that, you can actually specialize in certain areas that won't compete with us. And we therefore won't compete with you. So I thought this is kind of a really cool illustration as to um, how we begin seeing in, in this module um, the Europeans beginning to challenge and collide and some that have good meaning behind them, namely the Dutch initially, but particularly the French with the Spanish and the British kind of not having the best intentions uh, behind them. So with, with that, let's dive on into uh, our first quote here. So notice this is the Virginia governor and this is her diary entry. Um, um, and the first colony, if you remember, was 1607 at Jamestown. So a good, you know, almost 20 years have passed since the first have arrived. So she's kind of coming into this late in the game. But look what she says here. For our ship was so pestered with people and goods that we were so full of infection that after a while we saw a little bit throwing of folks overboard. Meaning people were uh, pestered. Uh, it, it's like that they had all sorts of ailments uh, going on with them and eventually dying with that. Few else are left alive that came in that ship. So the journey over uh, the Atlantic was not an easy one. We will unpack that more as we delve further into the, uh, the this modules. But be mindful that yes, people did want to escape um, Europe that had very little hope for them, especially if they were a serf or if they were poor or if they were nobility, they came looking for greater treasure to help their families' empires expand. But this was no easy journey, like for you and I to get on a plane and just hop, skip over and, and, and land with air-conditioned environment the whole way. This was a challenge, uh, to, to say the least. Well, we're going to discuss uh, today in this module uh, how did the colonization efforts kind of impact North America uh, in, in this early 1607. We're going to then talk about how each colony, or each European colony that is, namely France, and, and um, Spain and the Dutch uh, developed in ways that were vastly, vastly different. And then we're going to talk about how these European powers interacted. Some collided, some actually intermingled and had relations and, and marriages with them despite their Catholic upbringing uh, forbidding them from doing such a thing. So uh, hold on and we'll see you know where we take it. If um, you were wise, you will print out or copy this same graphic organizer and use this as you go through your reading and especially perhaps while I'm, I'm lecturing and, and giving you some notes uh, upon this. So with that, let's dive in and discover uh, soon here about, uh, I think we start with the French, but look at this map here, if you will. And this shares with you the various European nations 
that are, are swooping in and, and trying to challenge the Spanish foothold that has been taking place here. What they're lacking is Portugal. And if we were over here on the right-hand side, you'd see Portugal. But Spain has just been growing leaps and bounds, and they're using the Bahamas as their launch point to continue to you know, send people into Veracruz. Here's Veracruz. That leads them into Mexico City. And that's then what like, takes them to New Mexico and into um, different part, or Utah, into New Mexico, and then over here, eventually uh, toward the great Mississippi and to modern day New Orleans. And look what they do. They get all the way up above San Francisco in the town, I think, of Sonoma, where the furthest reaches are of the colonial um, mission system. So this map, I think, does a great uh, idea as to the extent of the Spanish Empire. I mean, when they landed um, there with, with Columbus in 1492, less than 50 years later, um, they have doubled in size and capacity of control. And a random fact um, is that Spain actually had in Mexico City, they had 85 years before Harvard was ever founded, way up here, they had a university um, in, in place. So the Spanish had a definite integrated idea of how to colonize, but also how to create or pass along their culture from European Spain. Up here you see the French and how they've started way, way up here with the founding of, of Quebec and then they'll go into Montreal and then they'll follow the river systems eventually going down to New Orleans. And then you have your English and your Dutch and the Swedish we're not going to talk a whole lot about because they're going to become later on in a different time um, in a few subsequent chapter or chapters. But re today we're going to talk about the Dutch and how they land in the New York area. And later on in other chapters, we'll talk about the English and, and what areas they team, seem to infiltrate. So with that, let's talk about the French and how they expand in the North America region. One thing that made them unique and different than the Spaniards is that they, they did not come with any sort of religious ideology or drive. They weren't here after gold, God, and glory, okay, per se. They were really interested in trade. Trade of what? Fish and the beaver pelts were their primary um, driving force. And so because of these, these aspects, they had actually pretty good relationships um, with the, the, the various tribes that they encountered. In fact, what also made them so unique is that they, they forbade Christian missionaries, the Huguenots, and I'll show you a little picture here of that. This is the persecution of King Louis towards the Huguenots, and I don't want to get into AP Euro too much, but you need to recognize is that King Louis had a definite idea and a mindset to keep the Christians out, unlike what... Um, that the England Church of England had done where they said, fine, you're unhappy with our form of religion, the Anglican Church, you can go start your colonies elsewhere. Here, King Louis says, you Huguenots, uh, you might disagree with our Catholicism, but you cannot leave. In fact, we're going to persecute you. Who then did go? Well, Catholic missionaries. And it seems historically, the Catholic missionaries that went from France found better ways to acculturate themselves um, amongst the Native Americans than certainly the Spanish. What you're seeing missing here is this encomienda system. Remember the Spanish brought in the encomienda system, which is basically allegedly was to work amongst the people and train them in the way of the Christian or Catholic faith. Well, in reality, in practice, it was nothing of that. It was a system of slavery and had nothing to do with Christianity. It had everything to do with about profit margins whatsoever. So why didn't more people come to settle? The French, another unique thing is Spain sent hordes and hordes and hordes of people to go and help populate and, and pass along their culture and conquer and vanquish aspects of the New World. The French didn't really do that. What was, what was their cause? Well, they're up in Canada and there you have minimal growing seasons. And so what's the point of bringing all these people there if there's not enough land, arable land that will keep them alive? And so they said, let's just keep it to to just trade and, and kind of keep happy with that uh, scenario. Now, what made them unique as well, and in order to, I guess, facilitate greater business um, ties and business um, relationships, is that the Frenchmen would take um, a Native American Indian wives. Why did they do that? Well, for one, to solidify trade, so that way, uh, you know, that will remain. 
Two, that they won't find themselves dead because, you know, they've adopted various Indian traditions and will be received more by the Native American tribes. But three, they learn new strategies from the Indian wives on how to prepare the beaver um, that was much more efficient than the way they had been taught by the Europeans as well. So this gave the French a very unique advantage um, over the Spaniards and especially the Dutch that will come in who aren't so bad, but then the, um, the British that eventually will come in as well that won't you know, learn the value that the Frenchmen had placed amongst the Native Americans. Well, the French aren't quite happy with just staying up in the Greater Lakes region uh, with the Iroquois Confederacy saying, yo, we have other business partners like the Hudson Indians that, that we can kind of travel with. And so they traveled to find a way to get the furs out in a quicker and more efficient pattern. So René Robert Cavalier, or Cavalier, but Cavalier is a French enunciation, was the first to actually find where the Mississippi River exited. And from that, he claims this land uh, for the French. Hence, when you go to New Orleans, there's a huge French contingency there that um, still speak this Creole type of blend of France. And you'll see a lot of French influence in the buildings and architecture are there. However, since there weren't a lot of French coming over, because the king was not financing um, as much as they did with Spain, and this wasn't a nationalistic driven, um, you know, um, colonization. It was very hard to hold these these footholds that they had. And, and so th this is uh, one of the drawbacks that the French, uh, that they will soon find themselves in problems with in Quagmire because the Spanish are, hey, hey, ho, ho, we're not going to give up this space easily. And then soon there'll be a collision course with, of course, the Americans uh, at hand. So here's a picture of the French migration. Here you can see um, them landing uh, off in, up in Nova Scotia going into Montreal. And here um, is them traveling all the way from way all the way up here down to our New Orleans. What an incredible journey that must have been to be seen all led by Native Americans. Well, now let's turn our attention to this other group of the Dutch. Now, the Dutch are interesting. The Netherlands were under the dominion of Spain. And the Netherlands were, were famous for building the boats that all of the Dutch and the British and mainly the Portuguese, all the European powers had used. So they had, um, why it was significant is that Spain owning and having the Netherlands part of their um, crown, if you will, that meant more profits kept going to the King of Spain, King Philip. Well, they, they declare their independence at this point. They essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sold tons of boats and built tons of boats for England. What did England do? They went and had a battle, okay, um, against Spain, and they defeated the Spanish Armada, which then really tilted um, the, the, I guess, the table, if you will, um, power table from Spain now dominating everything to where now there's a new um, boy in town known as the British. And we won't talk about them just yet, but we need to be mindful that this allows the Netherlands to say, well, teeter, 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 Spain, you gone, we're not going to let you control us. And at the same time, they also questioned this aspect of Catholicism because they saw how they were treating and, ex and, and heard of how they were treating other people, groups in the new world. And there's this new form, not new form, but this new um, structure of Calvinism that began to emerge. Uh, it's called the five points of Calvinism that basically said that man is evil and born evil, is that God saves those who he wishes. Now camp out there for a moment. There's unconditional elect, but it's basically God's elect. This will become very important when the Dutch and people who follow Calvinism move into different countries or global partners. Why? they're going to assume that the Native Americans don't have souls. So that's an interesting distinction, at least under Catholicism, and whether they went for good reasons, the Spanish, or good reasons, the French, they still at least saw the Native Americans having capacity of a soul that were worth saving. Well, not the Dutch and not under Calvinism. They're like, well, if God wanted them saved, he'll find a way to get them saved. It's not our responsibility to do that. So that, that was a unique aspect of them. So there they land on the Hudson River, and fur trading seems to be flourishing. 
And again, they're not there to conquer and vanquish the Native Americans like the Spaniards were. In fact, they had incredible relationships with them. What they did find out is that, huh, if we ever want to expand, we need to find ways in which we can kind of manipulate various tribes against one another. So here the Algonquins initially were trading with them, but as, as the Dutch wanted to expand and they eventually bought the, the island of what we call Manhattan in order to kind of protect their riverway uh, from the Spanish or the growing English presence, um, they, they began making you know enemies of the Algonquians and befriended the Mohawks, who offered what? More protection, but also they had family members who were on the greater interior of the lakes and beyond. And it was the Mohawks that can bring them um, more uh, beaver pelts, so enabled them to have greater trading partners around. So please be mindful that the Dutch are there and kind of only react and respond simply because of their need and desire for trade. They are generally peaceful towards them, um, but they do begin manipulating the tribes in order to get what they want. And now we come to Spain. Whew, you guys are doing well on this. And because of their losing their grip across the globe uh, and the Spanish Armada being defeated, uh, because they've grown so extensively and that takes huge amount of money and amount of people to come and do this, they were being spread thin and they weren't able to keep their foothold or stronghold on all of these types of situations. One of the first places that took place, and if you remember in a prior lecture, uh, I talked about in, in, in the town of in, in Pueblo in New Mexico, there was uh, just a really evil um, uh, conquistador named Soto who arrived and, and, and killed and maimed and raped women to remind them that we're the Spaniards and you need to do what we say. This is the guy that cut off one foot of every guy who was 25 years or older. Well, about a hundred years later, <laughs> and a lot of unanswered prayer, I suspect, by these uh, you know, Indians who have, I guess had become Catholic under their watch, they finally said, we've had enough. And so about 15,000 or so, I don't know the exact number, but it's close to that. Basically, after a hundred years, it just didn't simmering, simmering, simmering. We're weary of this. We're tired of being under the yoke of Catholicism and, and the Spanish influence. They saw that their power was waning and they couldn't keep as many soldiers there. And so there you see Pope, who was, who was kind of taken by um, some Spaniards, mistreated. He, he helped lead this revolt, so that's why it's called Pope's Revolt. And they were essentially successful at expelling the Spanish out. And this was good for you know quite a few years um, and what did they do during that time? Quite interestingly enough, they tore down every uh, church or ca not cathedral, but adobe brick building that had housed um, Catholic services in them. They went and killed uh, numerous priests. Um, they did everything they could. But what they did in one special special places is they they would actually dismantle the, the churches, if you will, and its place would put up a kiva, a little worship shrine. This is very similar to what the uh, and down in Aztecs, and this was known when the Aztecs were defeated. What did they do to Tenochtitlan right down there? The, the Spanish had crumbled that great uh, pyramid and built a church, a cathedral on it, which is still there in the Socolo right now. Um, so they've had kind of an interesting switch of fate that would uh, do these types of things. Well, eventually the Spanish did return, but they didn't have the strength uh, that they once held um, at that time. Well, that brings us basically to a close, the rest of this stuff will be done in class, but please be mindful that the French, the Dutch, uh, will eventually talk about the English and the Spanish certainly have a different approach and a different experience there on the new world. Keep a classy go bears. We'll see you next time.